turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 13, all right? Uh, we're almost finished up with this series called The Unexpected Jesus, where we're going through the gospel according to Mark and looking at several key passages throughout that book that talk about things that Jesus said or did that were maybe a little counterintuitive, that you wouldn't necessarily be expected, that his disciples didn't expect him to say or do. And, and taking all the preconceived ideas that we might have about Jesus and, and being willing to encounter the real Jesus in scripture and let that shake up our understanding from time to time. And, and one of the, the stark things that Jesus does towards the end of his ministry is has this conversation with his disciples where he kind of issues them a pretty long warning. It reminds me about fire drills growing up. Everybody remember having fire drills in school? Raise your hand if you, if you had fire drills. Uh, anybody still have fire drills? Like you work, maybe you work in the school system. Maybe you work somewhere that just enjoys doing fire drills. That's fine. And, uh, but, but at some point when, when you were a student, if you're like me, when the, when the fire alarm would go off, that was like a sound of joy. Because you got a few minutes of a break from class. The teachers got a few minutes break from you. You got to go outside into the parking lot, maybe enjoy the weather for a few minutes. And it was like a cool thing. It was seldom that we would hear the fire alarm go off and think, oh, there must be a fire in the building. Instead, it was, oh, they planned a fire drill. How cool. And, and, and it's sort of weird because it's intended to like bring us sort of alertness is supposed to you know send us outside same thing happens with car alarms right how many was the last time you heard a car alarm and you thought somebody's stealing a car right no we think somebody bumped into a car that's locked somebody hit their button because they're trying to find their car it's really more like a car locator alarm than it is anything else or, or, or when was the last time you were on a flight and they take tons of time, every flight, thousands of flights every day. And most of us have been on at least one and they still give the same spiel every time. It's like, your seat can become a flotation device. It's like, I didn't know this thing was going to go over the ocean. We're flying west. You know, I was like, like, do I really need to know how my seat floats? Like if we're in that big of trouble, is it really going to matter? And but we, we, we don't necessarily pay attention to these sort of warnings because we've grown so accustomed to, you know, they're just, they're just phrases, they're just or, or, or little speeches that are supposed to prepare us, but, but we don't really take them terribly seriously because it's so unlikely that something bad's going to happen. But what if you knew? What if you knew that something bad was going to happen? What if you knew for a fact going into school or going into work that sometime in the next year there was going to be a fire? How would that change your alertness when the fire alarm went off? Or if you knew for a fact somebody was going to have their car stolen and, and, and you started paying attention to the to the car alarm sorry. you knew for a fact that your plane was going to have to take an emergency landing, would you pay a little closer attention to the safety speech at the beginning of every flight. Jesus is going to give his disciples sort of a message of warning. And I guess the question for all of us heading into that is, how seriously are we paying attention to the warning that Jesus gives them? Starting in Mark chapter 13, uh, if you've been with us and you've been paying attention, you can always go back online and watch any messages that you've missed. But last week, we spent some time talking about how Jesus was teaching in the temple area in Jerusalem. His disciples are there. His critics and enemies, the religious leaders, were trying to trap him, and Jesus just shut down every argument. He, he was able to masterfully navigate all of these tough questions and traps that they tried to put him in, and instead he just taught so truthfully that people were in awe of that. And his disciples probably reached the end of that day on the highest spiritual peak that they had ever been on. They're just imagining, you know, Jesus is getting us ready for something big. Something big is right around the corner. We're not exactly sure what it is, but we're pretty sure if this is really the Messiah and we believe he is, then he's about to bring in his new kingdom. And what better place to have it? What better place to have as the headquarters of this new kingdom than right here in Jerusalem, right here in God's temple? As a matter of fact, in their day, in the first century, King Herod has been working on renovating God's temple and he's almost complete. 
All the renovations were complete by about, by about 50 AD. And so they're, they're reaching the very end. All of these uh, structures have been gone back and they've been made ornate and humongous. Some of these stones making up the pillars in the temple complex weighed several hundred tons. These were massive stones. This was an amazing building. And the disciples are picking out office space. And, and they say to Jesus, Mark chapter 13, verse 1, as he's leaving the temple, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Because they're excited about what's getting ready to happen. And Jesus looks at them and says something that makes their hearts sink. Do you see all these great buildings? He replied. Not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Now, they're anticipating that Jesus is bringing in this, this amazing new kingdom. At least, at least a new rule, new political system. Maybe, maybe they wouldn't be under the oppression of the Romans anymore. And, and regardless of what it is, they just cannot imagine that with the Messiah that God has been promising and predicting for hundreds of years with them they cannot imagine that anything bad's going to happen at this point but what jesus drops is sort of a bomb on them this building that you think is so impressive it's coming down and what you need to understand is that to a Jewish audience, the temple represented God's presence among his people, God's presence on earth. And so to say that the temple was going to be destroyed, that all the stones would be toppled over, you might as well have said this is like the end of time as you know it. In fact, it makes them wonder and ask a couple questions that are intertwined. They start wondering, well, Jesus, if... If this building is going to be torn down, then that must mean that must mean that the end of time has come. And, and, and so nobody says anything for several minutes. They walk out of the city. They're still stunned by what Jesus says. They make their way up to the Mount of Olives. And, and then the Bible tells us that they start asking Jesus, maybe timidly, some questions. Uh, Jesus, uh, what did you mean about that? When's the temple going to be destroyed? And Matthew actually tells the same story in Matthew chapter 24 and, and shows us that his disciples actually asked him two different questions, but were very related simultaneously. They said, tell us, when's that going to happen? And also, what will be the sign of the coming at the end of the age? We can't imagine that if the temple's going to be destroyed, that that is different from the end of time as we know it. They can't imagine that these two things would be Unrelated, They must happen simultaneously. But to Jesus, the temple's just a building, okay? The confusing thing, I think, is that Jesus answers both of their questions at the same time without differentiating between the two answers. And that makes this passage in the Gospel of Mark one of the most difficult passages to interpret because a lot of well-meaning Christian people look at this passage and they, they think, hey, Jesus is, is speaking in prophecy about what the end of time is going to be like. And other people look at this passage and say, Jesus is speaking in prophecy about what his disciples are going to experience in their lifetime and maybe some combination of both. And we look around the world today and there is no shortage of curiosity about the end of time. People ask all the time. It sells a lot of newspapers. Or nobody buys newspapers. It, it makes a lot of clicks, right, online or, or you know, it sells a lot of subscriptions and things. And, and, and people go out to a lot of seminars and everything because we all want to know, is the end of time close? We look at things going on in the world. We look at at wars happening and conflicts and corrupt government. And, and, and we look at, at competition with, with Christianity on the world stage. We look at persecution of believers in certain parts of our world that just seems so severe. We look at how corrupt and how, and how immoral things become among different pockets in our society. And we just start to wonder, man, the end of time has to become close. And so a lot of people get really curious about that. But what would Jesus say about all that? What kind of warning message would he give us? What would he want us to really lean in and pay attention to? I think we're going to get into that in this passage. But there's a couple things that we need to keep in mind. 
whenever we're reading scripture, if I've got the opportunity from up here while I'm preaching to kind of explain something that helps you and me as we read our Bible to better understand it, I got to share those things. And today we're going to practice a principle of correct Bible interpretation that I think can help you in your own Bible reading, okay? And it is simply stated this, literal if possible, figurative if obvious. Whenever we can take the scriptures literally, whenever it's possible to do that, we should do that. We take the words of Jesus at face value. When he says, love your enemies, guess what that really means? It means love your enemies, right? And, and, and so it's literally, it's exactly what we're talking about. But there are times where scripture is clearly and obviously being figurative. And we need to understand that as well. Jesus told his disciples, hey, this cup, this is my blood. Well, is it really? Or is it figurative? This is a symbol of the blood that he would shed for us on the cross. And there's a lot of people that, believe it or not, they get kind of confused about that. But when we take communion, it's juice and bread. But it's what it means and represents that matters to us. It doesn't actually turn into blood. That would be weird. Okay, here we go. So when we're talking about prophecy and Jesus predicting things that were going to happen in the future, we've got to consider this principle. All right, if it's literal... I mean, if it's obvious, then we should interpret it liter literally. But if it's figurative, then we should interpret it figuratively. Because if we interpret something literally that was intended to be figuratively, we're going to get the wrong idea about it. And vice versa, if we take something that was meant literally and, and we, we say it's just a metaphor for something else, then we're going to miss the idea there. And remember, keep in mind that this... This sort of language, this talking about the future, this predictive, apocalyptic type of literature, it's very weird for us. We're not used to hearing people talk like this. But in the first century, it was not weird at all. People foretold the future. People spoke in grandiose, sometimes hyperbolic uh, analogies all the time. And so as Jesus is speaking, we've got to try to understand what his audience would have understood as he said it. The second thing that I think is important is that we do know from history that the city of Jerusalem was completely ransacked by the Roman government in the year A.D. 70. And this is just something that happened. Historians unrelated to Christianity I document all of this happening. And, and every stone essentially in that building was destroyed, I mean, in, in that city was essentially destroyed and turned over. And so we know that for a lot of Jesus's audience, they experienced what he's about to talk about in their lifetime. And so I would say this, if we can apply what Jesus said to those events that happened in the year 70 AD, then we should. But that doesn't mean that he's not also hinting at events that still have not taken place yet. In other words, the, the end of time. So let's look through this passage. I want to try to teach through it. And then let's make some observations for you and for me about the things that Jesus told his disciples. Uh, by the way, pay attention as we go along. Anytime you see the words watch out or be alert, I want you to underline them in your passage. Here's Jesus explaining all to his disciples in response to their question, when's this temple gonna be destroyed? What's gonna be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? And he answers both questions kind of all together wrapped up. And he says this, watch out that no one deceives you. That's not exactly a time of when this is going to happen, okay? It's a warning. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. Why is he talking about this? Well, he knows that there's a time coming in just a few days where he's going to be nailed to a cross. He's going to be dead and buried, and then he's going to come back to life. But he's going to be with his disciples for a little while, and then he's going to ascend to heaven, and we're going to be left to do his work. And there's this period of time where we're waiting, and Jesus' primary concern as he begins is that we wouldn't be deceived. Mark Moore writes about this passage. We are anxious to see Jesus. We're fatigued by the trouble of this world. And that makes us ripe for deception by false messiahs who claim to be Jesus. But it doesn't have to be complicated. When Jesus returns, it will be as obvious as lightning. Therefore, if anyone claims to be Christ and calls you to follow them, don't. Christ will come and get you. You don't have to chase after him into some desert or to some secret cult compound. 
Jesus' primary concern is that we won't be deceived. And he goes on, verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, heard anything about wars or rumors of wars lately? All right. Don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. And so people look at that passage and they say they're looking all the time in our news and in headlines. Are there wars happening? Are there earthquakes? And every time you see one of these things reported, people say, oh, this must be pointing to the end time. But what's Jesus' point? He says these things are like birth pains. How so? Well, birth pains are usually preceded by a very joyful experience. You know, bringing in a new life into your family, a new child, that's, that is a beautiful, joyful thing, okay? Uh, but temporarily, there's some real discomfort. There's some real pain. It can be very frightening in the moment, but it's going to be followed by great joy. In that way, I think Jesus is talking about the things that we're going to have to endure, they're going to be followed by a great joy, don't be overly overwhelmed by what's about to happen. But remember what we said, if these things can be applied to 70 AD, we want to definitely do that first. Believe it or not, according to historians of the day, all of these things were documented as happening regularly in those intermittent decades between when Jesus spoke these words and when the Roman government destroyed Jerusalem. Multiple earthquakes, several different wars and rumors of war, not to mention uh, Rome's impending attack on the city. And... and and famines and different opportunities where, where people were without. And, and so as a result, I think that Jesus' audience, they were literally to be expecting the destruction of Rome as they saw these things unfold. He goes on to say in verse 9, you must, here it is, be on your guard, underline that. You will be handed over to the local Councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. And some people look at that and say, well, obviously there's all kinds of people around the world that have never heard the gospel of Jesus. That must mean that this hasn't been fulfilled. But to Jesus' audience, the known world was synonymous with the Roman Empire. They didn't know anything about North and South America. They hadn't discovered Hawaii or Tahiti yet, right? But they knew that as far as their understanding of their world, that Rome had conquered the known world. And by the time we get to the end of the book of Acts, the good news of Jesus had reached every corner of the Roman Empire, even to the capital in Rome. That's why we have a book to the Roman Christians called Romans. And the gospel had reached the known world in their lifetime. So understand from their perspective, this occurred. The gospel reached the whole world. And so what all is going on? Well, they've got to be on their guard. They're going to be persecuted. And we can read about in the book of Acts and also other historians how, how Christians were persecuted and arrested and brought before uh, officials to have to give an account for what they were doing and what they believed. By the way, when was the last time you heard about a Jewish synagogue bringing people in to be flogged? Okay, not exactly a modern occurrence, but certainly something that happened a lot in those first couple decades in the first century. Verse 12, brother will betray brother to death, his father, his child. Children will rebel against their parents. Well, that's no surprise. And have them put to death. Eh. All right. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And underline stands firm. Maybe it would be helpful to describe as a non-Christian historian contemporary of Jesus wrote what actually happened during Rome's siege of Jerusalem. Here are some of the phrases that Josephus writes about that destruction. He said, people's cries were louder than the military fighting. Jewish soldiers tormented citizens for food and children stole food from elderly parents and mothers stole food from their own infants. Thousands were crucified. There were horrible famines 
piles of dead bodies and mass graves. There was even cannibalism inside the city of Jerusalem. And then Jerusalem was burned. Many false prophets claimed God would save them. Over a million people died and nearly 100,000 were taken as captives and sold into slavery. And every stone in the city was torn down except a few towers. Believe me, this might as well have been the end of civilization as Jewish people knew it. And all of these things happened as Jesus predicted that they would. Now imagine this, if he predicted that, hey, you need to be prepared, you need to be ready, you need to be paying attention, this is going to happen. And then he tells them, when it happens, get out of the city. Go out into the hills, that way you'll survive this. Those who took Jesus at his word were spared a lot of suffering. They were spared death. They were spared this awful experience. He says... In verse 14, when you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, this is a strange term for us, I admit it, right? The abomination that causes desolation sounds like something from like a Tolkien novel or, or, or something weird. Uh, but, but the truth is, is, this is a quotation, a familiar phrase from the Old Testament. Several prophets, including the prophet Daniel, refer to the, the abomination that caused desolation. What is that? Well, an abomination is something that's sacrilegious, right? It's something that defies the, the glory of God. And so the, an abomination would be something that, that would just be blasphemous. It would be like, it'd be like some pagan ritual taking place in the temple. And desolation, of course, is destruction. And what we find is that as that's predicted in the Old Testament prophets, it came true on several occasions, even before the life of Jesus. On one occasion, the Syrian uh, leaders came in and stormed Jerusalem and, and made a mockery of the temple of God. They performed all kinds of pagan rituals. They destroyed altars. They, uh, they did all kinds of immoral and, and, and really gross kind of savage things. All right there in the place where, where God's people believe God's presence dwelled. Right? In the holy place of the temple. And then they ransacked the city. And that was in 137 B.C. So they had already experienced the fulfillment of these prophecies, but now Jesus is quoting this again. It's like, is this going to happen again? Well, again, Roman government destroys the nation of Israel and, and, and comes in and conquers the city of Jerusalem and destroys the temple in 70 AD because of their rebellion. And that pagan government that believes Caesar is God took up residence in the temple and started putting up statues to Caesar and, and honoring him in the process. This was completely an abomination to God's people. And it certainly left a path and a wake of destruction in its place. And so Jesus goes on in the next several verses, 15 through 23, talk about the stress of fleeing Jerusalem and the city at that time and, and, and better not to be pregnant, you know, at that time, because that's going to be tough. And, and there's all these kind of phrases here, but here, here's the, the takeaway. It really only makes sense if you lived in Jerusalem in that first century. I mean, our, if you and I are to apply this to the end of time, then what we would be saying is that if we, if we start to imagine that we're close to the end of time, we should all take a flight to the land of Israel east of the Mediterranean Sea and, and take up residence in the mountains in the, the land of Judea. Now, I don't know what the real estate market is like right now, but I don't think we'd all fit. And, and it just seems strange that we would take that literally... If, if all of this is still speaking of the end of time, that would be a strange place for us to all go. Plus, what are we hiding from? If we're talking about the return of Jesus, that's not something believers need to be afraid of or flee from. We should welcome seeing our Savior finally come, that, that God's judgment will finally come and, and punish all of the evil that has happened in our world. And, and while, the, while the people who don't know Jesus might be terrified of God's judgment, we are promised that Jesus is our advocate and, and that he goes before the Father and he claims that we are his and we belong to him and that we will be in his comfort and that we will be rejoicing at that time. As all the enemies of God are laid waste and we are ushered into eternity with him in heaven. 
Now, if he's talking about that, there's no reason to flee or fear. But if he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, there's a very practical thing here. You don't have to die if you'll pay attention to Jesus' words. Verse 24, but in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and heavenly bodies will be shaken. This is all terminology that's quoted from the Old Testament. And it's terminology that was often used, imagery, hyperbolic language that's being used often to describe the end of a nation, the end of a government, the collapse of a, of a society. It was such a monumental event that it used big language at that time people will see the son of man coming in the clouds in great power and glory and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens and all that sounds strange to us but it was it's common language that the jewish people would have been familiar with from the old testament and it would have been most often used in connection to the end of a government or a civilization Essentially, what Jesus is saying is that the, the Jewish nation was essentially going to be over. And we find that that mostly happened in the year 70 AD. Verse 28, now learn the lesson from the fig tree. Oh boy, here we go again with the fig trees. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. All right. Jesus says, even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Remember, Jesus is trying to give a warning to these people that are, are right there with him that in your lifetime, you're going to experience this stuff and I want you to be ready. I don't want you to have to suffer. I want you to be able to escape and I want you to trust me. And the, and the result of trusting Jesus' words was that they were spared a lot of this misery. And, and the fact that he says this generation isn't going to pass away ought to be our biggest clue that up until this point, Jesus pretty much been talking about things that happened just a few years after he was there. And we're tempted to continue to see lots of future events unfolding when it comes to the end times. But understand that Jesus' primary purpose was to inform and, and help and warn those that were right there of something that was going to happen before they tasted death. Especially verse 32. But maybe the way for you and I to understand this is if you've ever driven out to the mountains... You're driving out of the mountains and you get that first glimpse of those blue ridges off in the distance of the horizon. And you can't really tell from that vantage point which mountains are closer and which ones are further away. But it's beautiful to start to see that unfold before you. Now the closer you get, you start to see which mountains come into focus first. And some of them are closer and some of them are further away when at one time they all looked about the same distance apart. And I think sometimes that's how we need to approach prophetic scripture, even from Jesus' own words, and how we understand them. Some of the things that he's talking about certainly unfolded right then in the first century. But as we got closer to that, and as we start looking in more detail, and as time continues on, I think some other things begin to come into focus, that some of this also hints at things that have not yet occurred. At the end of time, at Jesus' second coming, when time will be no more and God will judge the earth and those who have trusted Christ will be ushered into eternity. But I think in both cases, Jesus has a main point. And this is what I want us to really start to lean in on. And that is that I don't think he was explaining these things just so that we would predict when they were happening. No, no, no. I think he was exhorting us to be ready regardless of when they happen. Follow with me here. Lost my place. Don't follow with me here. Don't lose yourself. Here we go. Verse 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, Jesus says. And about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. All right, if you're in middle school, you're going to love this next part because right in the middle of this Bible passage is a great big but. 
okay? And, and so you can underline but at the beginning of verse 32 because this is an extremely important but because this sort of divides the passage from talking about what only applies to Jesus's followers in their lifetime and what I think he begins to explain and elaborate on what is also going to be true of the end of time. And notice how he begins that transition. What he says to his disciples is equally true. What he says to you and to me today, everything in this world, the heavens and the earth, everything that we might look to and think is magnificent and great and mighty, every physical thing that we might look to as a, as a place where we're going to set up shop as, as, as Christians, as, as people reigning in the kingdom of God, everything that we might put our hope and trust in, all of that is going to be destroyed. And there's only one thing that's left. When the whole world is destroyed, the only thing that remains is the words of Jesus. And not only will they not be destroyed when the earth is, they will never be destroyed. Your hope and my hope is only correctly placed when it is in the words of Jesus. And Jesus' warning to his disciples then and to you and me today, have you placed your trust somewhere besides my words? Is your confidence about the future in something tangible that you're working on or that you think is some mighty power or is your confidence for the future exclusively built on the teachings of Jesus? A lot of people, I think, when it comes to the end times, we're motivated more than anything by curiosity. We want to somehow be able to predict when the end of time is going to be, when Jesus is going to return. Somehow, if we could just accurately predict that, all right, these things are going to happen and then we'll know that Jesus is back, that somehow that that's all that we need to know. And, and as a result, man, there are all kinds of articles and, 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 and TV shows and documentaries and seminars and, and all kinds of different books that you can go and check out because, man, there is an awful lot of curiosity about the end times. I mean, it, it sells subscriptions to, to online services. It, it, it piques people's curiosity. It is clickbait of our time. And we want to know, what's the end of time really going to look like? Are the events that are unfolding today around us, is that a sign that Jesus is coming back? Is it wars? Is it corrupt government? Is it the decrease in morality? Is it some, you know, uh, credit card with a chip in it that we're all going to have in our hands or something? You know, all these things that people get really excited about, is that really our, in, our, our, our focus, as Jesus is concerned, on the end time? Some of you, it, it, there's probably half of our group, maybe a little less than, I don't know, somewhere in there, half, give or take. Man, when you talk about the end times, oh, I'm so interested, I'm in it, I'm peaked, and I'm like, yes. And then there's the rest of us, and we're like, eh, I don't care. I don't really think about those kind of things. But here's the truth, whether you're interested in the end of time or not, every one of us in this room recognizes that life, life comes to an end. There is a day in our future, and none of us knows when that will be, where we will stop breathing. Where our hearts cease beating, where our brains stop firing impulses. And we don't know when that's going to be, but we know it's inevitable so whether you are interested in the end of time or whether you just recognize that as mortal humans that our life is not eternal yet and that physically we will die, I think you can apply Jesus' words to either. What's his main point? It's not that we predict accurately when he comes back or when our life is going to be over, but rather it's that we would be prepared regardless of when it happens, that we'd be ready, that it could happen any minute, and that would be okay. I think Jesus' primary 
reason for sharing all this with his disciples and even us is not about predicting when the end of time will be, but about preparing that it could happen any day so that we as his followers would stay alert and be ready. Here's two words that we've seen already through this passage. We're going to see in these next couple verses as we finish this passage out. The two Greek words are blepete, which literally means to look, to be alert, to be scanning. Right? It's sort of like the idea of a, of a soldier who's on a sentry watch and he is keeping his eyes open. But also there's a word, Gregorio, which is a Greek word that also talks about being alert, being awake. Right? Maybe, maybe you need some caffeine. Right? Don't fall asleep while you're on watch. And so here's what he says. I'm going to read several verses starting in verse 32. Jesus says, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father, be on your guard, be alert. Underline that. You don't know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Underline that, keep watch. Verse 35, there he says it again. Therefore, you keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, one more time, underline it, watch. You think you get the idea that maybe Jesus' main idea in telling us all these things is less that we would get concerned about the signs themselves and more that they would be motivation that we would just do what he wants us to do in the meantime? Jesus wants us to be ready. What does that mean to be ready? Well, let me tell you a couple things I don't think it means from the context of this passage. Being ready for the return of Jesus or the end of our life whichever comes first, is not about accurately predicting when it's going to happen. And and be leery anytime somebody says that they can predict when that's going to happen. In fact, you should probably just turn away because Jesus made it clear. They don't know. We cannot know when that's going to happen. But secondly, being ready is not about trying to prevent the inevitable. Right? These things are going to happen not because man made them happen, but because God decided that it was time, right? That he is done putting up with evil and he is going to punish the evil in the world. That he is ready to judge all of the wrongs that have ever been done. That he is, he is not about corrupt government continuing. So what good would it be for you and me to spend all of our time looking at the end times and try to prevent things like natural disasters or governments from being corrupt or morality and culture from going completely haywire? No, no, no. This judgment is going to come not because we caused it to happen, but because God decided it was time. And being ready also doesn't mean that we're afraid. There's no reason to fear the return of Jesus if you have trusted him as your savior. If you haven't, maybe maybe that ought to terrify you. But if you're a follower of Jesus, there's no reason to be afraid Here's what I think being ready means. I think readiness is our commitment to urgently doing the will of God. Readiness is our urgent commitment to doing God's will. He gives this example, this parable. The man leaves his house in charge of, with his servants for them to keep watch. Now their job goes on the minute he leaves. They're not to just sleep and and hang out and do whatever they want until they predict accurately when the master's coming home. No, no, no. Their job is to keep the business of the house, maybe to keep the farm going, to keep the animals fed, right? To, To keep everything up and to vigilantly protect it against intruders, against people that would steal from them and protect it until his return. And the whole idea is that they don't know what might happen. They don't know how long the master's going to be gone, but their, their jobs are to continue on until he does. And Jesus tells us to be alert, to be on our guard, to be ready. It's like the parable that Jesus told in another time about a master who left three servants in charge of sums of money. He called them talents. Talents. 
And, and they were each given different amounts, but the first two servants took those talents, took that money, and they invested it, and they earned the master more money. But the one servant who was afraid of the return of the master buried his talent, and when the master got back, the servant went and dug it up and handed it to the master. See, I kept it for you. And he was punished. He was punished because his fear of the return of the master didn't motivate him to be active and to be doing more to please his master. What are we talking about? I think Jesus' warning to his disciples then, and for you and for me now, as we look to the end of time or the end of our life, whichever comes first, is that he is most concerned that we are ready, that we are urgently committed to doing his will the entire time while we wait. That we don't get complacent, that we don't fall asleep, that we don't lower our gaze and start fixing our confidence on things that we can touch and see that are tangible, that are all going to be destroyed. Instead, that we wouldn't let anything get in the way of doing what God has commanded, which we can boil down to at least a couple things. Making disciples and loving God and loving people. Loving God and loving people and making disciples. And anything else that we pursue in this life is secondary to that. And so here are some things that I think that we need to be watching out for as God's people and be productive in while we wait for Jesus to return or for our life to be over. Romans chapter 16, verse 17, I think we need to be watching out for divisiveness. Paul writes, I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. All right, so are there people that you've allowed to distract you because they're divisive? You love getting into an argument. You love drama, you know? You think that your mission for God is to go argue with somebody who's argumentative? Jesus says, no, stay away from those people. By the way, if you're one of those people, stop it, right? Get about the business of doing what God calls us to do. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, right? And, and, and in Proverbs, it tells us that, you know, blessed is the one who, who brings unity among those who are at odds. And so our point, our job is instead, as we wait the end of time, is to never allow our differences or our arguments or our preferences to dissuade us from continuing to do ministry and the ministry of the gospel, doing good to those who, who are in need, telling people how to be saved from their sins, equipping followers of Jesus to do ministry. Those are our priority. And Paul says in Titus chapter 3, verse 10, that we're to warn a divisive person once, even twice, but after that, to have nothing to do with them. Be willing to set aside and leave behind negative people in order to keep committed to God's will. Secondly, we need to watch out for false teaching. And, and maybe you expect that to come from some like cult leader or some strange book they put on your doorstep. Or, or maybe you're expecting false teaching to come from you know, some other religion. But you know where I think a lot of dangerous false teaching happens? It happens as our culture sort of seeps in to our church. And we wind up taking things that are partially true and accepting them as if they were fully true. Cody Pinckney writes that some who call themselves Christians today are drawn away from the truth and start worshiping a false Messiah. And many of us would say things like this. Jesus was a good man. He gave wonderful teaching. His morality was exemplary. If only we could live up to his commandments. Or another person says, Jesus came as an example to us, showing us how to love each other. And now all who sincerely try to live a life of love belong to him, no matter what they might believe. Or another person says, Jesus is a savior. Believing in him offers us one way to God. Surely, however, God will honor all those sincere believers of other religions by bringing them to himself. Now, here's the scary thing about that. All of those statements contain a little bit of truth. But you know what it's called when something has a little bit of truth and a little bit of falsehood? It's just called false. It's just called wrong. You, you can't drink a glass of water that just has one little spoonful of poop in it, right? That's gross. 
You, you can't believe something that's mostly true or else you believe something that's false. See, here's the truth about those three statements. Of course Jesus was a good man, but the Bible says that he was also God incarnate. And to leave that part out is to miss the central message of the New Testament entirely. He was not just a good man. And of course Jesus provides us with a great example to follow, but the Jesus of the Bible also becomes our indwelling savior. He is not just some external role model. He comes to reside in us when we surrender to him. And the Bible also says that Jesus is not only a savior, but he is the savior. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father except through me. Jesus is not just a way, to find God, but he is the way that God provided for anyone who believes to not perish but have eternal life. Jesus warns us not to be led astray by false claims about himself. Galatians 1 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. And we have already said, and now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Can you discern what the gospel is, the good news of scripture about Jesus is from any other message you hear about Jesus? We need to be able to stand up not only against false gospel, but just against the tendency to want to hear our own preferences repeated to ourselves. If that's not a definition of social media, I don't know what it is. Here we go. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and following. Paul says, a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look to teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. It's going to get uncomfortable. It's going to get less and less popular. And fewer and fewer people will put up with listening to someone teach what they don't already believe. We got to pay attention to that and be prepared for that. Why? Because it's inevitable. Jesus is coming back or our life is going to end. One of those is going to happen first. It's not about predicting when it's going to happen. It's about being prepared when it does. And finally, we got to be Watching out for falling asleep. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Just a little more than a day after Jesus has this conversation with his disciples, he has the last supper with them up in the upper room and he finishes teaching them and they, they finish up the supper and he, he prays over them and then they go out into the Mount of Olives into that garden called Gethsemane. And he asks his disciples, his closest friends on earth, will you just pray with me? Will you, will you be alert and watch and pray? And he walks essentially a stone's throw away from them and he just pours his heart out to God. Lord, if there's any other way besides the cross. And he's sweating so intensely that it's like drops of blood. And, and not just once or twice, but on three occasions, Jesus returns for a moment to check on his disciples. And all three times, he finds his disciples asleep. I mean, who can blame him, right? It's a holiday meal. It's late at night. They're full, right? They get a comfortable spot. I mean, who hasn't fallen asleep at night in their bed under the warm, cozy covers? Oh, let me pray real quick, right? And, and, and yet in that moment with that context, knowing what we know now, 
how alone Jesus must have felt that his disciples weren't ready. Believe me, after the crucifixion, after his resurrection, I'm sure his disciples always remembered this moment. I can't believe we fell asleep for a few hours while we were praying. I can't believe that we weren't paying more attention. And I'm sure that's stuck in their minds. And that's why they're writing this over and over again in, the, in their letters throughout the New Testament. Man, we need to be sober-minded. We need to be alert. We need to be awake. And I don't think it's just physically falling asleep that matters. I think, I think what Jesus is trying to prepare us for is complacency. Falling asleep in the job. Losing our heart and our fervor and our excitement for the things of God. The ministry in the gospel can never become replaced by our own comfort and our own agenda. We've got to keep watch. And the church, it, it can't just become about making a good show and doing some fun things. Like we have to protect this congregation, even from ourselves, from false teaching and division and, and, and getting lazy. Jesus said, we don't know when he's coming back, but it will be all of a sudden. And he doesn't want to find us sleeping on the job. Therefore, we need to be ready. We need to be urgently committed to doing his will. Can I conclude today just by reading to you a portion of a letter? A letter that was written to Christians many, many years ago, but who lived in a very similar culture. Their government was predominantly pagan, non-Christian in nature. They were doing all kinds of corrupt and immoral things. In fact, immorality was as common as the clouds in the sky. But as I read this letter written to believers just like us, could we hear it fresh today as God's message to us? The letter says, first of all, you need to know that at the end of time, mockers are going to have a heyday. Reducing everything to the level of their puny feelings, they will mock. So what happened to this promise of his coming? Our ancestors are dead and buried and everything's going on just as it has from the first day of creation. Nothing's changed. But they conveniently forget that long ago, all the galaxies and this very planet were brought into existence out of the watery chaos by God's word. And then God's word brought that chaos back in a flood that destroyed the world. And the current galaxies and earth are only fuel for the final fire. God is poised, ready to speak his word again, ready to give the signal for the judgment and the destruction of the desecrating skeptics. Don't overlook the obvious here. Friends, with God, one day is as good as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. God isn't late with his promise. Not the way some measure lateness. God is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end time because he doesn't want anyone to be lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. But when the day of God's judgment does come, it'll be unannounced like a thief. The sky will collapse with a thunderous bang, everything disintegrating into a huge conflagration, earth and all its works exposed to the scrutiny of judgment. So since everything here today might well be gone tomorrow, do you see how essential it is to live a holy life? Don't expect the day of God, or excuse me, daily expect the day of God, eager for its arrival. The galaxies will burn up. The elements will melt away that day, but we will hardly notice. Why? We'll be looking the other way, ready for the promised new heavens and promised new earth, all landscaped with righteousness.
So my dear friends, since this is what you have to look forward to, do your very best to be found living at your best in purity and peace. Interpret our master's patient restraint for what it is, salvation. When you think about it, the big reveal of Jesus is not that time is gonna end or that our lives are finite, we know that. I think the big reveal, the unexpected thing from Jesus is that he says a lot of people aren't gonna be ready for it when we could be, we could be. When time is no more, what will you be found doing? When you reach that last day of your life, what will we be able to see was really important to you? If you knew for a fact that, that Jesus could return today or next week or within the next year, would you live your life differently? If you knew he was gonna return in just a few months, how would you reprioritize your time? Who would you wanna tell about how they could be saved from their, from their sins and spend eternity with Jesus? What would you wanna be doing if you knew it was inevitable? Because it is, because he will return. And he's called you and me simply to be ready. Are you? Are you ready? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for instructing your disciples and giving them a clear warning. Not that the end of time would come, not that terrible or difficult things would happen, not that they would even have to suffer for a little while. You're not warning them about that. You're warning them to be ready, just like you're warning us. Don't put it off. Don't assume we've got more time. Don't keep saying, I'll do that one day. God, I pray that you would find us when that day comes, urgently doing what you want us to do, serving people, making disciples, helping people find and follow Jesus. We ask it in his name.